Now, we're going to uh, take you to some business news now on the programme. Michelle Pellegrin is joining us here on set. Uh, the US Justice Department is considering breaking up Google, of course. Huge story this, isn't it, Michelle? Mm -hmm. The Justice Department uh, told a federal judge that it is mulling over whether to recommend uh, that Google be forced to sell parts of its operations, which would be a historic uh, antitrust move not seen since the attempted breakup of Microsoft two decades ago. Uh, this would be a, a way to tackle the monopoly it holds over the online search market. Uh, Google criticized the filing as being radical, saying it would have significant unintended consequences for consumers, businesses, and American competitiveness. Well, for more on this, uh, Michael Furtick joins us on set. He is the founder of uh, Heroic Ventures. Thanks for being with us. What's your take on this? Do you buy Google's argument that this uh, will hurt American competitiveness? My take on this is that we're covering this story about three years too early. That's my take on this. <laughs> it's going to be a long time through a series of appeals. Your reference to Microsoft is a very good one, right? Microsoft's antitrust case took decades and never really went anywhere. Before that, the IBM antitrust uh, case took decades, never really went anywhere. This one is going to take a long time to unfold. What is interesting about this case is that the U.S. Antitrust Task Force and the European Union Antitrust Task Force seem to be walking in lockstep on this issue. It's very, very interesting to see how uh, antitrust in EU and U.S. are often sort of coordinated or appear to be coordinated in tandem, and I think this is no exception. About a year ago, the European Union designated six companies, five of them American, as so-called gatekeepers to the internet. And of course, Alphabet Google was one of them. And in this case, the DOJ, the American Department of Justice, is making similar allegations. They're saying that the, the, the different constituent parts of Google, of Alphabet, interoperate in a way that makes for a monopoly that needs to be broken up. Now, the judge has ruled it is a monopoly. That's already in law now. That will be appealed. And now the DOJ is trying to seek remedies. One of those remedies, the most extreme remedy, would be you got to break up. So I think we're a few years early. I don't think the breakup is going to be obvious. I think by the time the few years roll, uh, roll, roll on, we'll see actually some countermeasures from the economy itself. Uh, but I do think it's a big piece of news mm -hmm. and very interesting to watch. Well, we'll have to move on to another story, but this is a story we'll definitely get back to over the, over the years, apparently. Okay. <laughs> uh, different topic with a new estimate of the government's uh, public accounts released in the United States showing a steep deficit. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that the U.S.'s budget deficit for the fiscal year 2024 topped $1.8 trillion, with the government collecting $4.92 trillion in revenue and spending $6.75 trillion. These figures driven by higher spending on interest payments, about $950 billion, up 34% from the previous year because of higher rates, as well as spending on large federal entitlement programs like Social Security and Medicare. This data published in the middle of the U.S. presidential campaign where both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are proposing tax and spending plans, which are estimated could add trillions more to the deficit over the next decade. Let's look at both of those plans with Michael. Uh, Harris is looking to expand Medicare programs by including a new uh, long-term home care, for example, and paying it for, for it with uh, higher taxes on corporations and, and top earners. What impact do you see this having? Where, where should you come into power? So this is actually the first real substantive new economic policy that Harris has proposed. It's about five minutes old, five days old. She proposed an extension of entitlements to seniors that so they can age in place. It's very, very interesting. Of course, these things are expensive. It's very, very hard once you start an entitlement program to reduce it. But this is classic Democratic entitlement spending and, and, a, and a familiar move, right? Everything else that she's got in the policy, such as we have it, we don't have a lot of specificity from either campaign, by the way, but every, every other plank is pretty much rinse, wash, repeat from Biden. And Trump's program, however, uh, on the other side, involves extending his uh, signature tax cuts, yes. but also uh, new programs that would cost a lot of money. Uh, for instance, his uh, promise to in implement mass de deportation. What does that mean for the U.S. economy? Well, I'll tell you, these are two extraordinarily populist campaigns, right? So. The Washington consensus of a few years ago of the Clinton era is now out the door. There's a new Washington consensus, which is spend as much as you can. This is a bruiser of an election. It's going to come down to the wire. It's going to come down to tens of thousands of votes in about three or four states. And so there's as much purchasing of votes as you possibly can get, as you could possibly imagine this election. I haven't seen it in my lifetime this bleak. So I will say that, that both policies are very, very populist. It does appear that Trump's policies will create even larger deficits but it's not clear. These are very, very unscientific measures, but his, his policies do seem to indicate even larger deficits than, than Harris's. 
The likely reality of this is split uh, Congress, where uh, it's very difficult to get any measures through, uh, which is sort of what we've been seeing over the past few years. So does that mean uh, that the, you, the environment for the U.S. economy remains the same? In the effect? most important word for this election is actually filibuster. So right now, the U.S. Senate requires 60 votes to stop debate and bring any policy, any legislation to a vote. That is not in the Constitution. That's not a law. It's just a policy that the Senate adopted. Now, this time, the Democrats, sometimes the Republicans, but this time the Democrats have vowed to end the filibuster for many types of legislation. If they do, then you will start seeing legislation start getting passed in Congress for the first time at a high rate in decades. If they don't, then it won't. Now, just, just a fair warning, right? Right now, a lot of people will say, we want the Democrats to end the filibuster because we like their policies. But vengeance will be the Republicans once they take back the Senate one day, whether it's this election or another one. There's a lot of reasons to believe they'll hold the Senate or increase their position in the Senate. The vengeance will be also for the Republicans. So be careful what you wish for. You might actually prefer gridlock in D.C. Uh, Michael Furtick, thank you so much for being with us. As a reminder, you're the co-founder, the founder of uh, Heroic uh, Ven of, uh, Heroic Capital. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that thank you. That is it for the uh, business news. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you to our guest, uh, Michael Furtick, as well, here on France 24.